Newton was a decidedly odd figure, brilliant beyond measure, but solitary, joyless, prickly to the point of paranoia, famously distracted. Upon swinging his feet out of bed in the morning, he would reportedly sometimes sit for hours, immobilized by the sudden rush of thoughts to his head, and capable of the most riveting strangeness. He built his own laboratory, the first at Cambridge, but then engaged in the most bizarre experiments. Once he inserted a bodkin, a long needle of the sort used for sewing leather, into his eye socket and rubbed it around, betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the back side of my eye as I could, just to see what would happen. What happened, miraculously, was nothing, at least nothing lasting. On another occasion he stared at the sun for as long as he could bear, to determine what effect it would have upon his vision. Again he escaped lasting damage, though he had to spend some days in a darkened room before his eyes forgave him. Set atop these odd beliefs and quirky traits, however, was the mind of a supreme genius, though even when working in conventional channels he often showed a tendency to peculiarity. As a student, frustrated by the limitations of conventional mathematics, he invented an entirely new form, the calculus, but then told no one about it for twenty-seven years. In like manner he did work in optics that transformed our understanding of light, and laid the foundation for the science of spectroscopy, and again chose not to share the results for three decades. For all his brilliance, real science accounted for only a part of his interests. At least half his working life was given over to alchemy and wayward religious pursuits. These were not mere dabblings, but whole-hearted devotions. He was a secret adherent of a dangerously heretical sect called Arianism, whose principal tenet was the belief that there had been no holy trinity, slightly ironic since Newton's college at Cambridge was trinity. He spent endless hours studying the floor plan of the lost temple of King Solomon in Jerusalem, teaching himself Hebrew in the process, the better to scan original texts, in the belief that it held mathematical clues to the dates of the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. His attachment to alchemy was no less ardent. In 1936, the economist John Maynard Keynes bought a trunk of Newton's papers at auction and discovered with astonishment that they were overwhelmingly preoccupied not with optics or planetary motions, but with a single-minded quest to turn base metals into precious ones. An analysis of a strand of Newton's hair in the 1970s found it contained mercury, an element of interest to alchemists, hatters and thermometer makers, but almost no one else, at a concentration some forty times the natural level. It is perhaps little wonder that he had trouble remembering to rise in the morning. Quite what Halley expected to get from him when he made his unannounced visit in August 1684, we can only guess. But thanks to the later account of a Newton confidant, Abraham de Moivre, we do have a record of one of science's most historic encounters. In 1684, Dr. Halley came to visit at Cambridge, and after they had some time together, the doctor asked him what he thought the curve would be that would be described by the planets, supposing the force of attraction toward the sun to be reciprocal to the square of their distance from it. This was a reference to a piece of mathematics known as the inverse square law, which Halley was convinced lay at the heart of the explanation, though he wasn't sure exactly how. Sir Isaac replied immediately that it would be an ellipse. The doctor, struck with joy and amazement, asked him how he knew it. Why, saith he, I have calculated it. Whereupon Dr. Halley asked him for his calculation without further delay. Sir Isaac looked among his papers, but could not find it. This was astounding, like someone saying he had found a cure for cancer, but couldn't remember where he had put the formula. Pressed by Halley, Newton agreed to redo the calculations and produce a paper. He did as promised, but then did much more. He retired for two years of intensive reflection and scribbling, and at length produced his masterwork, the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, better known as the Principia. Once in a great while, a few times in history, a human mind produces an observation so acute and unexpected that people can't quite decide which is the more amazing, the fact or the thinking of it. Principia was one of those moments. It made Newton instantly famous. For the rest of his life he would be draped with plaudits and honours, becoming, among much else, the first person in Britain knighted for scientific achievement. 
even the great German mathematician Gottfried von Leibniz, with whom Newton had a long, bitter fight over priority for the invention of the calculus, thought his contributions to mathematics equal to all the accumulated work that had preceded him. Nearer the gods no mortal may approach, wrote Halley, in a sentiment that was endlessly echoed by his contemporaries and by many others since. Although the Principia has been called one of the most inaccessible books ever written, Newton intentionally made it difficult so that he wouldn't be pestered by mathematical smatterers, as he called them, it was a beacon to those who could follow it. It not only explained mathematically the orbits of heavenly bodies, but also identified the attractive force that got them moving in the first place, gravity. Suddenly every motion in the universe made sense. At Principia's heart were Newton's three laws of motion, which state very boldly that a thing moves in the direction in which it is pushed, that it will keep moving in a straight line until some other force acts to slow or deflect it, and that every action has an opposite and equal reaction, and his universal law of gravitation. This states that every object in the universe exerts a tug on every other. It may not seem like it, but as you sit here now, you are pulling everything around you, walls, ceiling, lamp, pet cat, toward you with your own little, indeed very little, gravitational field. And these things are also pulling on you. 